for November uh, 2024. Um, as I've mentioned before, um, if you are joining uh, for the first time, or even if you're joining for um, the 17th time or 30th time, please let us know in the chat who you are, where you're joining from, what the weather's like, and how you're uh, using or planning to use ROAR. We'd love to hear that. Um, here's our agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to give just a few general updates. Um, consider yourself welcomed to the call. We always love to see you. Uh, we're going to hear just a, a short update from our curation team about work that they've been doing to improve the metadata in the Roar Registry. We're going to hear actually quite a few technical updates from our wonderful technical lead, Liz Krzynarich, um, including about a forthcoming small schema change, uh, 2.1, um, and some client identification plans. Um, I will give you a, a sort of an overview of some recent notable Roar adoptions and show you some stats about ROAR adoption in uh, infrastructure metadata. And then we're gonna hear two presentations. Um, the first from the Works Magnet, which is a joint project of uh, the, the Ministry of Higher Education in France and Open Alex, a, com a project to enable community corrections to Open Alex's metadata, very interesting and exciting. And then we're gonna hear from Amrita Riley at the USGCRP uh, Global Change Information System. Uh, discussing uh, their work and their use of ROAR. And then we'll have uh, some time for open Q&A. Uh, we'd love to hear about anything new that you're doing with ROAR and generally uh, answer your questions. We hold these community calls pretty much every other month. Um, we just give you updates on what we're doing. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to give us feedback. Uh, on any topics of uh, overweening interest. And of course, uh, we love to see demos from people who are adopting ROAR, and we've taken to doing about two of those every time. Uh, we announce these on the ROAR Community Forum, which I encourage you to join, and on our events webpage. Uh, and these are meetings, as you may notice, not webinar. So do feel free to, to talk amongst yourselves in the chat, um, and we will try to um, read those aloud for the recording and answer those, of course, also in the Q&A period. Um, we do record these calls and publish uh, those recordings publicly on our YouTube channel, uh, and then we post the slides afterward as well so that you can always ac access those. We do have a code of conduct that we ask you to abide by uh, in general, keep things professional, polite, collegial. Uh, and then if you are joining, if English is not your uh, primary language, we do hold meetings in English, but we encourage you to click show captions in Zoom to show captions in your language, if you would like to see that in a language other than English. If you'd like to get involved beyond these calls, you can always submit features and bug requests on our roadmap on GitHub. And we do have discussion channels, one that's sort of a more general one for um, uh, general discussions, general announcements uh, of uh, events, especially, and blog posts. But we do also have a Roar technical forum, which we really encourage you to sign up for, especially if you're using the API. Um, we tend to announce, um, you know, if there are any status updates to the Roar API, any difficulties with that, that's uh, the place you want to be to get information about those. Um, if you'd like to be involved in registry curation, of course, we have a community-led registry here, so you're always welcome to submit a request. And then um, you can always tell us about how you're using or planning to use ROAR. And perhaps we can invite you to present uh, as a featured integrator on one of these calls. So here's just a few general updates from the last two months since our last call in September. Um, just wanted to, to point your attention to a couple of blog posts. Uh, Adam Buttrick, our product lead, who is here on the call, has been co-writing a series of posts with Dominika Tsacek from Crossref uh, about strategies for automatically matching text strings to identifiers. This is something that um, uh, some people might call AI, <laughs> but I think is more properly called uh, often uh, sort of machine learning or natural language processing. There are lots of different strategies for doing this. Uh, we have Justin Barrett on the call from Open Alex here. We did an interview with him um, a few months ago that is also on our blog in which they uh, in which Justin uh, discusses with us um, how Open Alex ma manages this task of taking raw text strings and matching them to identifiers. So if you're interested in that kind of work, uh, please consult that post and that series of posts. Maybe look up the Open Alex case study as well. 
Um, we also uh, recently published uh, a case study with Rowan Cockett of CurveNote. Uh, Rowan presented uh, on the community call in July about CurveNote, which is a very interesting new publishing platform that has structured metadata built into it. Um, recent events uh, include, uh, we had a, a webinar with Science, which has contributed a lot of really fantastic ROAR features to DSpace, a very widely used repository software. Um, so new versions of DSpace. So if you're interested in that, please take a look at the uh, recording and or slides for that. Um, we also uh, recently held a, a nicely um, well attended webinar um, as part of the ACRL, the American College and Research Libraries Association um, choice webinar series. And so we, we co presented with Kyle Demis of Open Alex, um, basically an introduction to ROAR and an, a call to people to improve their organization information in ROAR, which then subsequently improves the organization information in Open Alex. And we'd like to ask you to save the dates. Um, for the upcoming ROAR annual community meeting. Um, so we, we're, we're planning four sessions for February 4th and 5th. Um, we're gonna have a general community update in which we reflect on 2024 and do some planning for, uh, let you know about our plans, ask for feedback on our plans for 2025. Um, we're gonna have just an informal drop-in session afterwards. We're just gonna keep the Zoom open so you can chat with ROAR staff, ask any questions, get some FaceTime. Um, we're gonna have a panel discussion the day after that still kind of working out the topics and presenters for that. So um, feel free to uh, give us any ideas for that if you like. And then um, we're farther along in the planning for a session on successes and opportunities for ROAR in the Asia Pacific region, which is going to be at an APAC friendly time zone, um, uh, which is fairly late in the US and is like middle of the night in uh, the UK in Europe. Um, so, but of course that will be recorded and we will share that. Um, and we've got some fantastic presenters for that. So save the dates. And if you would like to, um, to know when registration is open for those, again, I encourage you to join the Roar Community Forum. We will send those registration links and further descriptions for that. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Riley Marsh, our metadata manager, who is going to tell you some things about uh, curation updates. Riley? All right, thank you, Amanda. Hi everyone, Riley here to provide you with some quick curation updates. Um, let's see. Um, Amanda, if you could switch yeah. the... Yeah, I'll do that. Sorry. I thought as co-host, you'd be able to do that, but I guess not. There you go. There Thank you go. You. Um, okay. Uh, outside of our normal curation activities, our focus over the last couple months has been on improving our domain coverage. Um, and we've used uh, data drive from both Educain and from ORCID um their email auto lookup parsing and we've been able to validate and add domains for approximately 5,000 records um, with even more domains on the way so um, as a part of this work we've also been able to develop some robust link checking um but that when we validate and add these domains we're also testing website links and updating these values alongside them so this has allowed us to update links for many of the records where domains have been added um, with the most common changes just being a simple HTTPS upgrades. And um, we've also removed language specific page references. Um, as we work through more of the domain data, we'll continue to apply this link checking and the uh, overall link data should be greatly improved. Great. Okay. And just a note, uh, Riley, that's in version two only, right? We're not, or or repopulating any of those things to websites in V1? Um, let me, Adam, I'm gonna let Adam speak. Yeah, in. so <laughs> the website changes are populated in V1. It's just the, uh, because they, they get crosswalk back when we update the website, okay. um, it, only domains are obviously added in V2. Okay, great. That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure that we had that in there. Okay, great. So um, besides domains, when we're moving into the next quarter, we're gonna be focusing on some project work to improve our coverage of records in um, Portugal and in Japan. Um, and we're also doing some data pipeline assessment for adding new external ID values, which we talked about at last meeting. 
Um, and last but certainly not least, we'll be doing some reconciliation of publisher records from a variety of sources to better support this use case. Um, okay, and that's really it for me. Um, as always, if you have any questions or you need assistance with word curation, feel free to reach out to us either at registry at roar.org or um, you can email me at my email, uh, riley at roar.org. All right, thank you. Uh, great. Thanks, Riley. And I uh, happen to notice that we have Katia Laranjera here from Portugal on the call. I was just um, seeing Katia's wonderful presentation um, uh, with ORCID about uh, ORCID integration into um, PT Chris. So Katia, if you'd like to say anything about that project to uh, improve um, Portugal metadata in Roar, we'd love to hear from you either now or in the Q&A. So, yeah. Um, okay, I guess I can just jumpstart and um, say a few words. So we ha have started to um, develop a plan to transition from the system that we have implemented, uh, which is the ISNI Plus, to ROAR. And as part of that plan, uh, the first step is actually to uh, articulate with the ROAR team to make sure that uh, um, the, our landscape in terms of uh, national institutions are represented uh, in, in ROAR. And so we have done a first exercise where we have um, looked into ROAR to see what the gaps were. And we have already um, made a submission to, to add uh, the records that were missing. And we are now um, doing this in a more systematic way. So we hope that, um, I don't know how long it will take, but I hope that in uh, the short term, we will have most of our organizations represented uh, in ROAR so that we can uh, start to actually uh, make the transition without disrupting the processes and mechanisms that we have nowadays and that are based on our um on the ISNI Plus uh, system. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Sorry to put you on the spot, but no, that's, uh, okay. that's, that's great to hear. I appreciate it. Liz, hand it over to you for some technical updates. All righty. Um, hi, everyone. I am Liz Krasnarj, Roar's uh, technical lead, and I have a few quick uh, updates for you, the most important of which is a tiny little schema update that we are um, planning to make and actually already working on. So many of you may know we have had a major schema version update in the works for quite some time. And in fact, we launched that uh, V2 in March of this year. So it's been live on production for, for eight months and seeing some usage. And eventually that will uh, become the, the default version. And then we will sunset the, um, the current default version, which is version one. One area of that of the schema that we made a lot of changes to in version two versus version one was the uh, geographical location information. Version one had a huge amount of fields that were largely not populated um, and it contained basically a, a copy of all the fields from geo names, but some of them had never been populated. Some of them were uh, kind of scattershot, messily populated. And more importantly, they weren't uh they weren't the most useful fields and they were causing some some serious curation challenges so we pared down the geolocation information in version two and with the uh with the geo geo names id that is included in each record um anybody can go and find the remaining very detailed very granular information so we did go through a few rounds of feedback on version two that didn't raise major issues with the way that we had had paired it down. But as version two has um, gotten out there and gotten some usage, we've gotten feedback saying that we took too many fields out basically, and particularly country subdivision information. Um, so we released a very tiny um, proposal document uh, about a month ago, um, proposing to add a couple of fields back into, um, into version two. We're calling it schema 2.1, but we are rolling these changes into the existing uh, API version two because it's not a breaking change, it's a minor change. So per our version policy, 
Um, we only version the, the API on major version changes. So these are just going to kind of silently go back into uh, version two. Um, so what that will look like, this is the current version 2.0 locations field, which contains the geographical information for, uh, for an organization. It has a geo names ID, um, country, latitude, longitude, and then the name that corresponds to the geo names ID. What we are adding to that is um, we had some requests for continent. So we are adding the geo names um, continent information to the record since it was fairly easy to fulfill that request at the same time as making these changes. Um, and also um, based on feedback that we had gotten from a number of folks, the country subdivision code, which is the top level subdivision um, for a country. So that varies depending on what the country is. It might be a state, might be a province, might be something else. Whatever GeoName says is the top level um, country uh, subdivision. So in the, in the case of US, it's um, state code and state, state name. Um, and that's about it. Some minor changes, but hopefully they will add some things that will um, make a lot of people happy and that you will find them helpful. Um, I am already starting to work on these changes and we are planning to have those ready for release and all the data populated by the end of uh, 2024. Again, the API URL for version two won't change. These, uh, these couple of new fields will just appear under version two. Um, and that leads us into talking about timing for sunsetting version one and introducing version two as the default and then the, the, the only supported uh, version. And we kind of viewed adding these fields as a prerequisite for doing that since we had had a number of um, requests. Uh, the schema 2.1 proposal should be openly available, but I can fix that in a second. Just fixed it. Okay, thank you. Um, I know the public comment one was available was openly available. Um, so what we are proposing with the switch from V1 to V2 is making V2 the default beginning in July of 2025. So requests that don't contain a version in the URL path will default to version two instead of version one. Both versions will still be available at that point, uh, but we're talking about switching the, switching the default. And then we would like to uh, discontinue V1 at the end of 2025. Um, just for a little refresh, we did release a schema and API versioning policy, I think two years ago, we um, released that and had some comments, uh, discussion on that. Our, um, per our versioning policy, we support um, a schema version, at least one, a previous schema version, at least one year after the new schema version has been released. So we're adding, in this case, we'll be adding an additional nine months beyond the minimum um, sunset period. So we are hoping that that will give uh, folks enough time to make that switch, but we would of course be happy to, um, to hear your feedback on that. It is, um, it does cause a fairly significant amount of curation overhead to support multiple versions um, at once. So that is our internal interest in um, eventually sunsetting the the version one, since we do um, crosswalk every time we we make an update, it's in version two right now, and we have to map that back to version one and deploy both both versions. Um, so if you have comments on that, please put them in the chat. I'm going to roll onward because I have some a uh, couple other things to talk about, and I know we have presentations uh, to get to, so I don't want to take up the whole uh, the whole meeting with this. Um, another project that we had open for public comment um, uh, beginning in August and closed in, in October, and we've been talking about it in this meeting, is API client identification and also um, some changes to rate limiting, to base rate limiting on uh, client identification um, in order to, um, to continue our API stability and to um, make sure that it works well for um, for users, and we've had some experience with some 
some unpleasant actors in the in the API that are hurling many, many requests for multiple IPs um, all at once. So we would like to have something more than just IP addresses to identify API users with. So um, we had a proposal open with a couple of different um, options. Um, and uh, after the comment period closed in October, we created a final proposal. I summarized the comments and the basically, the upshot of that is that we will be creating a simple form for registering a client ID. Um, and we're not talking about actual, like complete authentication or authorization because we're not trying to control access to any of our resources with this. We are simply trying to tie requests to a given client so that we can contact folks if there's a problem and if people are doing things that are really causing challenges in our API and degrading performance significantly for other users, um, we have the ability to um, mitigate uh, some of that. So I'll be asking folks to register for a client ID. That client ID should be included in the header of API requests to receive the current rate limit of 2,000 requests for five minutes. And eventually requests without a valid, valid client ID will receive a very, very low rate limit of 50 requests per five minutes, um, but still enough to do sort of demonstration or just manual kind of poking around um, with the API. Our plan for this is a phased implementation in 2025. Um, so we estimate in Q1, we'll start to support registering for these client IDs, but we won't actually be applying um, rate limiting based on the presence or absence of that client ID. Um, we would like to launch this, the rate limiting portion at the end of 2025 to align with the version two, um, or to align with the V1 sunset and the version two um, is the, the supported version uh, to actually start applying the rate limiting based on the presence or absence of a valid client ID with the idea that um, if you're kind of already making changes to, to code that uses our API, you might be able to do to make this change um, at the same at the same time. Um, as with all things, we will provide notice about the exact implementation date well in advance with lots of reminders to our various uh, communication channels. Um, that is it for me, um, but happy to answer your questions uh, in the in the chat. Uh Thanks, Liz. And um, as, I, as Liz said, we will give you lots and lots and lots of uh, advanced warning about um, that V1 deprecation. Anne asks, this is a good question, will the rate limit be applied to both V1 and V2? I think that it will be. Is yes, that absolutely. Um, although the V1 will be deprecated at the same time we begin enforcing the rate limits um, sometime late in 2025, so technically really only v2 but um right. but yes yeah and it, currently just to um to clarify our current rate limiting we do rate limit um requests at a to a limit of 2000 per five minutes it's done based on ip address though so if you're sending the same the requests from 50 different ip addresses um that's where we have challenges uh with um with rate limiting um, and that is applied to both version one and version two it's just all requests Okay, and um, speaking of versioning, um, I have a very quick poll here. Um, we would love to know uh, which version of Roar you're using, if you are currently integrating it, uh, and which service you're using, whether you're using um, the data dump or whether you're using the API. Um, so I'm going to launch that right now. Uh, we'll take just 30 seconds to answer that and then see what people say. I will say there, there's an option here for if you're not sure which version of the Roar API or data dump you're using, which is entirely fair. Um, but chances are, if you're not sure, you might not want to bother answering the poll. <laughs> but we'll see. OK, a few more seconds. OK, we will we'll see. So it looks like, uh, can everybody see those uh, poll results? Uh, it looks like 
um, fairly evenly, to be honest, uh, beyond version one by the API, version two by the API, version one by the data dump, version two by the data dump. So yeah, fairly evenly, evenly spread out. Great. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, give you a, a little bit of updates on um, uh, Roar adoption. Uh, probably the most notable uh, Roar adoption uh, recently was that Web of Science did launch its Roar integration, um, and we are in the process of planning official announcements about that. Those of you who attended our, attended our September call probably saw a fantastic presentation from Tilla Edmonds of Web of Science, and at that point they were showing us sort of what they had built that wasn't actually live, and they launched that on November 7th, so that's great. Um, we'll hope to hear more and do more publicity about that. Um, and I'd love to hear, and then hopefully afterward, I'm hoping to hear from people who use the web of science, um, whether they're using Roar in the web of science, because that's pretty, pretty fabulous. Um, sort of an interesting integration that some people here might be interested in. Um, again, one of many Roar integrations that we only learned about after the fact, because people just uh, integrated and then we don't know about it. Uh, but this, I think, is relatively recent integration into a really kind of interesting tool called the Open Sanctions Database. Um, or just open sanctions. And it's essentially a, you know, kind of an aggregator, really nice data model for sanctioned organizations. This is something that um, sometimes uh, funders and publishers ask about a lot. They want to make sure not to fund organizations um, that are, are under various um, regulatory sanctions by various countries. Um, so Roar is one of their uh, data, many, many data sources and entity IDs that they use in there. So if anybody is interested in building some kind of um, sanctioned organization check into their system, this might be a really good source for that. We had had one or two queries about this before. Um, recently found that Biohacker Archive, which is really a, a preprint server for activities coming from essentially hackathons <laughs> in the biosphere, uh, have integrated Roar. Uh, they, it was kind of an interesting integration because they were building it into LaTeX, um, which was kind of cool. Uh, BR Chris, the Brazilian research information ecosystem, is working on integrating Roar. Um, they've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and yeah, so if you are using or planning to use Roar and you have not yet told us about it, uh, please let us know here in the chat or uh, fill out the form at bit.ly slash Roar hyphen integration hyphen form. And we will feature you on our website and perhaps again ask you to give a presentation at one of these calls. I'm going to very quickly, just for the next couple minutes, go over um, my my panoply of charts about Roar usage in Crossref, Data Site, and Orchid. Um, so Crossref records with Roar IDs and affiliations has been going up and up. Um, we have also heard that um, Roar for funders is on the brink of um, deployment at Crossref. So if you are, for, so for publishers, for Crossref members who are registering DOIs, they will now very, very soon, um, if not uh, right now, be able to add Roar IDs for, for funders as well as for author affiliations. So that's very exciting and we'll begin tracking that as well. Um, I always like to do the, the type breakdown um, and I'm always glad to see that the primary type um, of entity in, uh, of, of item in, in Crossref uh, that does use Roar IDs is the journal article. We've been tracking um, Roar data site records with Roar in affiliations um, for quite a while. I've had to change these, these charts to log scale <laughs> because of a recent um, massive deposit from the Japanese um, National Institute for Fusion Science which has deposited, I think, about 6 million records with data site that have extremely good metadata, including Roar IDs for affiliations. So you can see that um, um, about two months ago uh, in early September, um, the number of data site records with Roar IDs and affiliations was, was still very good. It was something like three or four million, uh, but now it's more along the lines of 8 million. And I should mention too that this is a bit more than 10% of all data site records. This is probably somewhere along the line, I haven't done the exact math, but something like 12% of data site records. Data site has um, roughly, I think, 70 some odd million, million records. So great adoption in data site. Uh, similarly, Roar IDs are, are heavily used 
uh, in data site records to identify funders. And um, also, uh, this is a brand new chart, brand new stat that we've been tracking. This has been available since uh, January 2024 with the adoption of data site schema 4.5. Um, but we just weren't tracking it really, so I've begun to track it. And I have done historical data for data site records that are using Roar ID to identify publishers. Um, so you can see again that because the Japanese National Institute for Fusion Science is using Roar IDs to identify publishers, very, very large number, over 7 million records in data site uh, use Roar IDs for this purpose. And in fact, Roar is, you know, fundamentally, um, the default and practically only identifier that is used for this purpose in data site. Uh, data site's technical community manager, Kelly Stathis, helpfully gave me the breakdown chart that's in the center of the other chart, um, in which you can see that um, the next most common identifier is actually the, the um, German authority file identi identifier that is only used in about 2,600 records. Uh, and there are, you know, for instance, re 3 data IDs, Wikidata IDs that are used for this purpose, but overwhelmingly it is the Roar ID. And, the, and again, this has really only been possible since uh, January 2024, uh, since early this year. Um, so we're really glad to see that. Um, that's an increasingly important use case for Roar IDs. Yes, and Roar, and Roar in lowercase, Carol, yes, you are right, is Roar also. <laughs> we do know that. I had, um, if you, yeah, it, Kelly gave me some uh, nuanced queries in order to catch all of the weird, a lot of those missing ones, those 2300 missing ones, uh, about half of those are actually Roar IDs too. It's just slightly quirky metadata. Um, so yes, we are capturing all of those, including the lowercase Roars. Um, so ORCID records with Roar IDs. Um, this again, um, so this is uh, 3.2 million. And notice that this chart really only goes back to April of 2024. Roar adoption in ORCID is um, really um, going up uh, at, a, at a nice pace. Um, and uh, I can do this kind of proportional thing for really um, lots of things, but you'll see here that the for all identifiers in ORCID, um, ROAR is now at 44%. And although I haven't shown it on these slides, um, again, back in April, that was only at about 33%. So again, ROAR is increasingly becoming the standard, the default identifier for organizations in ORCID. Um, I see a question from Anne in the chat. Do you plan, plan to compute these lovely charts on Open Alex affiliations? Do you know? Um, I had not planned to do that. We could do that, but I don't know. Um, yes, I, I will. We will take that under consideration. My understanding is that Open Alex uses almost exclusively Roar IDs, so but we could. Uh, and of course, they're matching them. Is it, our institutions? We only have Roar IDs. Yeah. Um, so we're at a hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, I could put a nice like instead of a pie chart, I could just put yeah. like a, a nice circle that says Roar IDs one hundred percent. That'd be great. Uh, it'd be nice to do to look at the the number though and of course since they do the matching too it's not as much of a a measure of like what what entities are choosing to do um i suppose that's true in orca too anyway interesting I idea i think it'd be interesting to look at uh the percentage of roars where it has any match in open alex um that's like one of the projects we're working on right now is newly minted roars that uh right now are having trouble getting affiliations in open Alex. Uh, and that's something that we're working on. So yeah, that sounds great. We will talk about that. Um, great. And now I'd like to um, turn this over to Anne Lote. Uh Here is a works magnet. So if you you as an entrance, uh, you have a research field. And on this field, you can search for affiliation string or war directly. So by example, I know a laboratory in France that is called the ESSEC. So I, if I search for that, I can search for ESSEC. But this laboratory has an error too. So if I look for the ESSEC in the raw website, I will find it here. So if, as you can see, there are some acronyms there, aliases and so on. And there are some children, child organizations, sorry, there. So if I look for a row here, um, it will grab the aliases and other names to be able to, to, to let's say, improve the, the search to be more 
so at least as extensive as possible. And I also have a get children from raw button that will uh, load from the API all the children of this in of this organization. Uh, let's say be as uh, complete as possible in my search. So uh, you can search for year two. So if you're more interested in the recent years, you can filter on it and you can exclude raw two. So the use case here are to try to find the, the works from the ESSEC that will not, not have the, the raw of ESSEC trying to, to do the matching. So I'll go for, let's say, an, the as easy as possible example for the, for the demo. So if I only look for ESSEC here, so now the um, works magnet will collect all the works in OpenAlex and try to, let's say, compute the, the different affiliations and, on, and try to list only the unique versions of the affiliations. So that you can see here, normally in my screen. So that's all the different versions of the ESSEC affili affiliations found in OpenAlex. And the game here would be to try to find the errors that might be present in the OpenAlex database. So if I, so I can see here that most of them have the correct, um, the correct uh, row of ESSEC, but I know that there might be some mismatch with uh, another ESSEC in Douala. So if I search for Douala here, uh, I can find that this one is uh, has the, the role of the ESSEC in France, but clearly the affiliation is in Douala, which is so it's incorrect. So I will ask for um, for Open Alex to remove the one of the ESSEC of the French ESSEC here. So I just delete it here and validate my modification. I can do it from one row to several rows. Rose, sorry, and after that, I will just send back, uh, send send feedback, sorry, to to Open Alex by clicking on this on this button. I can um, seize my email address here that will remain um, private at least uh, on the on the it, GitHub issues, and then. So the correction is sent, and it's sent as a GitHub issue that you can see here. So um, all of this is public and freely available for everyone that would be interested in the in the um, corrections, open alec corrections or, or whatever corrections if someone else need it. So here is the correction that I just sent. It's it opened a GitHub issue here and uh, you can see that there is the raw affiliation from open alex here. And the the new version of the rows uh, submitted and the previous version, just like the the corrected one and the previous one. So if I go back to the presentation here, the the plan would be, oh, or maybe, okay, sorry about that. So yeah, that's just what I said before, and and that's another issue. So. After that, OpenAlex will take the, um, the correction into consideration and they close the issue with a nice, with a nice comment in it saying, okay, we, 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 we ingested this correction at whatever date and the affiliation is, is uh, visible. The correction sorry, is visible seven days after that on the website. So uh, until now, we already have uh, 700 uh, corrections on the GitHub uh, repository, and uh, most of them have, have been taken into consideration uh, by OpenAlex, thanks to them. So yeah, that, that was my part. Justin, if you would like to, to explain your own work, I can show the screen if you, if you want. Yeah, uh, well, you can, yeah, it's just the next um, slide. Um, I just wanted to give like a quick overview of like what happens after it's made into a GitHub issue. Um, so we have someone on our team going through each of these requests and validating them to make sure that um, they're not removing ROARs um, that shouldn't be removed and that the ones that are getting added actually should be getting added. 
um, because each time someone is making a request to the works magnet, it applies to uh, a handful of works, um, not just um, a single work usually. Um, so we wanna make sure that the correct words are getting added and removed. Um, but as long as we approve them, uh, then uh, they basically are automatically ingested and um, they're applied at the work level. Um, so it does not uh, change that string for everything in the future. Um, that's probably uh, a pretty big drawback right now of what um, of what we're doing. Um, and I think maybe we can change that in the future to incorporate these strings and maybe like retrain our institution parsing to to better map. But um, as of right now, it just changes the works that were specified. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we send out an automated um, response to or comment on the GitHub issue and say, hey, we ingested this and it'll be available in seven days. Um, we're right now at about like a two week cadence of, um, of getting new issues in, um, approving or rejecting them, and then uh, getting them integrated into OpenAlex. So about every two weeks we run a script, uh, whatever um, issues have been approved, get ingested. Um, so usually I would say if you submit a request, the longest it should take is about three weeks. If you get us like right after um, we've ingested, um, but it should be between a week and two weeks uh, in most cases. Um, but there are some that do get rejected less. Uh, less of them have been happening recently, but towards the beginning we were getting um, a lot of requests where someone would remove the, all of the roars for a specific string and only put in the roar that they think they should add. Um, so we caught a lot of those before they went live. Um, but there are a lot of um, requests right now that um, haven't been approved and we're trying to figure out a good process to go back and, um, and either change the request so that they are correct uh, or notify the user to say, hey, we, we didn't um, approve this request. Would you like to make a change or something like that? Um, but yeah, I just listed some common reasons for disapproving a request. Um, we've had uh, invalid ROAR IDs submitted. Um, we've had ROARs that haven't related to the string. Um, and then we've had, um, as I mentioned, ROARs that get removed even though they should not be. So um, just things to think about if you are using this to make sure that the ROAR IDs are correct uh, and that it would apply in all versions of that string um, that you are uh, correcting. That's about it for us. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I'm gonna share my own screen. Um, we are a bit uh, behind time, so I wanna make sure to pass things over quickly to um, Ruth O'Reilly from uh, USGCRP uh, Global Change Information System. I'm Ruth, I think you could, oops, sorry. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Amrita Riley. Um, I work for US Global Change Research Program. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, yeah, so I work for U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, USGCRP was established by Congress um, in 1990 to coordinate uh, federal research investments um, um, in the U.S. And uh, right now, uh, uh, there are 15 federal agencies collaborate and coordinate to uh, produce a report, which is called the National Climate Assessment, um, which is produced once, released once in four years. Um, and GCIS is a project of uh, product of U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, it is an open source web-based resource that connects information uh, to support climate reports um, and our main users so scientists and public and um, the this is the front page of GCIS and uh, these are the models that we support uh, one of the models we support is organizations and um, which is why we are using ROAR IDs to integrate IDs to organizations model and uh, we basically capture, uh, identify, organize, present, and maintain a record. So starting from the report, which is the National Climate Assessment, and we have several models that support the report. And um, one of the models is organizations, like I mentioned, but we um, we uh, 
start capturing uh, the data and also archive the data in GCIS. Um, these are the publications of U.S. Global Change Research Program. Like I mentioned, uh, it's released once in four years. Our latest report is Fifth National Climate Assessment, released in 2023, November. Um, and these are other reports that are released, uh, previous reports released before, um, fourth, third, and um, other. These are supplementary uh, reports su supporting um, the National Climate Assessment. And uh, here's the website, which is nca3.2023.globalchange.gov that takes you to the actual report page where you can download the PDFs, um, including the chapters and other um, items related to the report. Um, so the reason why we have GCIS as a project to USGCRP is to trace uh, the product and also provide provenance and support to uh, climate science, which is uh, very complicated. So we try to put all these things together uh, in a portal um, and also collect the metadata for uh, these reports and organize them in our database. Um, yeah, so we track the sources data and including the processes of what it takes to create a figure and who created a figure and who you should contact to create a figure um, and the processes taken and the models and the methods used to create a figure uh, to improve or increase the reproducibility of uh, the figure created um, in our reports. And we also provide, provide the traceable tools to um, create that figure. And um, the reason why we need traceable provenance is obviously to increase the credibility of um, uh, the figures in the report and then um, and, and to enable the reproducibility and, and to inform decisions to customize data to, to your location um, or um, any figure that you'd like to reproduce. Um, so here's an example of where we start from the report and the report has um, several chapters and the chapters have figures and um, from figures you could even uh, extract the images and um, if somebody created an image um, using data set and the activity to create the image and uh, we capture all these items and uh, if you notice we also capture the contributors for each and every process which is the authors and affiliations um, related to you know, each of these models and um, and since we are collecting a lot of affiliation, currently we have about um, 20,000 affiliations in our system, which are directly, directly or indirectly related to uh, the National Climate Assessment. Uh, when I say indirectly, it's um, the citations of the report. Um, so we collect the affiliations for the citations of the report as well. Um, so that's why we thought we would, uh, you know, adopt um, a persistent identifier for affiliation. Um, just like for a person, um, we use ORCIDs, ORCIDs um, for person, um, and for affiliation, we decided to use ROAR IDs. Um, and here are the other persistent identifiers that we are using, and some of them we get directly from the EndNote file, um, but some of them like we, uh, we had to research and add them. Uh, for example, ROAR, uh, we had to match ROAR IDs with GCIS um, and um, some persistent, uh, some other IDs like Wikidata and ISNI, we get it from ROAR API, uh, but we, we use all these IDs uh, in GCIS. And um, so uh, we, a couple of years ago, we tried to match ROAR and GCIS. We t uh, we've we try to do a title match um, and um, URL alias and acronym match to GCIS. Um, and out of the 20,000 organizations, we were able to match. Uh, currently, we have about 3,600 uh, matches in GCIS. Um, so yeah, and we are hoping to uh, match every year and see if we, there is any latest version. Um, of matches. The reason why we have um, 3,600 out of 20,000 is uh, we also have department level and other um, level of information, not just the parent organizations. Um, yeah, and we also try to match using, um, you know, validate using the country and organization types uh, because sometimes there are same titles. Uh, for example, Department of Defense in France matches 
with the Department of Defense in the United States. So we had to uh, validate somehow to um, avoid um, the title, same title issues. Um, yeah, and um, this is an example of how ROAR, um, we display ROAR in our organization in, in the uh, front page of organization. Uh, we collect, we match the title um, uh, with GCIS, and um, we also use the API. Once we match, confirm, validate the IDs, we get the ROAR data, and um, these, um, you know, so we are getting these from the API um, in the ROAR box here. And um, uh, the reason, the main uh, use cases uh, that we are using ROAR for is to um, add match affiliations of the direct authors of NCA. Uh, for example, uh, the fifth national climate assessment released in November, 2023, uh, there were about 700 authors, um, including all the chapters of the national climate assessment. And we had about 400 unique uh, affiliations. Um, and sometimes authors don't give the perfect affiliation titles to um, uh, to us. So uh, it takes us a lot of time to process the affiliation. Um, so for the sixth national cl climate assessment, uh, our process includes in the survey system to um, have authors enter ROAR IDs, find their ROAR IDs of the organization and enter into uh, their survey system. So we don't have to process the affiliations for them. So, um, so it would be easier for us to match affiliations as well. So we're using, um, that's one of the primary use cases why we're using ROAR in our system. Um, and the second, um, I can show a quick demo of how a chapter looked like for NCA um, 5 in GCI. This is the example um, of a chapter forest. Um, in NCA uh, five, and uh, and these are the organizations uh, affiliations of the authors. So, if I click one of the affiliations here, and uh, here's the ROAR data, um, and it takes you to the ROAR page of that organization. Um, yeah, and then uh, and uh, not only that, like I said, seven hundred affiliation. We are also tracking affiliations for the citations of the National Climate Assessment, which is for NCA five was eight thousand um, citations, and uh, each um, citation, uh, each publication, if it could, be, it could be a journal article or report, has their own authors and affiliation, and we track them. And for NCA5, uh, the number of affiliations we tracked for these citations are uh, about 10,000. So we were able to match some of the um, affiliations with the ROAR. Um, and for NCA6, uh, I hope with these matches, be easier for us to process those affiliations as well. Um, and another use case is uh, the dashboard that we have created for um, the NCA5. Um, and we track the report organizations and we create statistics for all these organizations um, of the citations as well. And uh, this is where um, we uh, thought ROAR was very useful for us to get the data of these affiliations so, so we can create the statistics of where these citations are coming from and the types of um, the organizations. Um, so yeah, those are the current use cases of ROAR in our system. Um, and like I said, we match 3,600 organizations. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me present. And if you have any questions, uh, this is my email if you want to reach out to me. Thank you so much, Amrutha. Really fascinating. Some beautiful, uh, beautiful graphics there. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, we are um, just one minute before the hour. Uh, I'm sorry we haven't left quite enough time for questions, but um, feel free to ask. Um, feel free also to um, uh, post any questions in the chat um, if you have them right now. Um, if you have questions for the ROAR team, you can always write support at ROAR.org um, or info at ROAR.org. And um, if you have additional questions for the presenters, we can likely put you in touch with them. All right. Um, remember, save the dates for the ROAR annual meeting, February 4th and 5th, um, or February 6th, if you're actually in the APAC region. Um, thank you all so much for joining, uh, and we hope you have a great rest of 2024. We'll see you next year. <laughs>